Yes, I've been at church retreat up in Red Top Mountain all morning today and this afternoon. And it was good in the colors, in the sunlight. And yes, I walked a bunch, hiked some. I'm ready to take a nap, but I want to do this first. Spend a little time with you. So thanks for being here. In Daniel 11, which is the chapter we're still on, there's mention of Moab, Edom, and Mount Seir as the, the nations that will not be troubled at a specific time of the great battle. And so I wanted to review with you, I'm, I'm breaking stride a little bit to go read from Second Chronicles today, which we reviewed at the first part a couple weeks ago of, of this part of the series, we reviewed it, but I want to review it again. I want to read out of Second Chronicles 20 today. I hope you're doing well. Find me in Second Chronicles 20, if you will. It's a good story. But before we read, I want to pray. Lord God in heaven, I thank you for your wonders of creation. I thank you for the wonder that you have created the Bible and preserved it down through the ages for us. And I ask that you will help us to understand it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Second Chronicles 20, starting with verse 3. Jehoshaphat, who was the king, feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O God of our fathers, are not thou God in heaven and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heaven? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the seed of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwelt here and have built you a sanctuary here for your name, saying, if when evil comes on us as the sword, judgment or pestilence or famine, we stand before this house and in the high presence for your name is in this house and cry to you in our affliction then you will hear and help. And now, behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom, whom you wouldn't let Israel invade when they came up out of the land of Egypt, but turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of your possession, which you gave us to inherit. O oh, our God, Will you not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that comes against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are on you. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, hearken you all Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go you down against them. Behold, they will come up by the cliff of Ziz and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a loud voice on high. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear, O Judah 
and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers to the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. And these were to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord sent ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to destroy and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. That's a story of when God stepped in and none of God's people had to take up a sword and fight. There are a couple places in there, the Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir is one of them. We're going to come to that little passage, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you prosper, believe his prophets, so shall you be established. That's going to be important today. Now we're going to the Revelation stories. Um, this may be the, the last one in this lesson, and then we'll have two more after this, and we'll be finished with Revelation stories if things go that way. Now I want to review the plot of Daniel and Revelation. I will move through it quickly. First, both prophets are in exile. One in Babylon, the other in Rome, as the plot of wrong versus right is introduced. Second, the political and religious movements of the ages are introduced with an image dream in Daniel and seven churches in Revelation. The introduction includes both plot and characters. Third, the opening action in Daniel is Babylon's decree about worship made as a loyalty test. The opening action in Revelation shows a worship scene in heaven, declaring the worthiness of Jesus. Fourth, the king is converted in Daniel, and the gospel progresses in Revelation. Fifth, Daniel shows the fall of Babylon, the nation who made a decree about worship, and John shows the fall of Rome the nation opposing God in his time. The opening action brings both progress for God and the fall of the opposition. I have suggested in this seminar that my own United States will experience a religious backlash and begin making religious legislation. When this nation makes a law about who, when, and how people will worship, then issues will become clear to many people and they will convert to the true worship of the creator on the Sabbath he created. Also, when this nation makes a law about worship, this nation, having passed the boundary of the principles on which it was established, will meet its demise, just as Babylon and Rome met their demise after opposing God's people. Sixth. In Daniel, another nation follows the example of Babylon in making a decree about worship, this time the result of a jealous scheme. And in Revelation, the dragon, that is Satan through the Roman Empire, is jealous and makes war against the woman, that is the church. Seventh, at the heart of the action, four beasts conglomerate to blaspheme God, war against the saints, and try to change God's law. The decree goes worldwide. Eighth, God sends out his final announcements that the sanctuary will be vindicated in Daniel and that of the three angels in Revelation, a call to worship with warning that will cause all to forever settle their choices. I believe that just as the United States has exported democracy, so it will export the breaking of these principles. Many other nations will follow its example in making religious legislation. 
Soon the laws will be worldwide, and so will be the spread of the gospel. Ninth, deliverance is begun by the Messiah in Daniel and by the plagues in Revelation. Tenth, demonic hindrances to deliverance raise up but are overcome. The prince of Persia in Daniel and the woman in Babylon, the woman called Babylon in Revelation. Eleven, in the final war, God's people instruct others and do exploits in his name. And that's in Daniel. In Revelation, Satan is bound as the lamb and his armies conquer. Twelve, the epilogue shows the new earth and the new Jerusalem in Revelation. And God's people shining as the stars forever in Daniel. From Ellen White's books, like Early Writings and The Great Controversy, I have researched her when, then passages, along with other passages indicating sweet sequence. It seems to me that the plot of her predictions for the future follows the plot of Daniel and Revelation. She never claimed such a parallel, although she did strongly urge Adventists to study Daniel and Revelation together. There are any number of possible explanations for the phenomenon of this apparent parallel. My favorite is that God works the same way throughout the ages. Therefore, all pictures of his plans will be similar in some ways, no matter when or to whom given. Another possible explanation is that God simply showed the same things to Ellen White as he had to Daniel and John. I think it is even possible that John tried to match Daniel in some ways. He probably knew the book well. <clears throat> that would lead me to the possibility which I think viable, that Ellen White sensed the plot of Daniel and Revelation and intentionally followed her perception of that plot as she wrote the visions which God himself had given her because the visions fit that plot. This view of Ellen White increases my trust in her as a prophet. I have hereby tested her according to earlier prophets, and she sends the test. The Lord says, believe his prophets. That's how you will prosper. By surrendering my own will, by following the slain lamb, and by believing God's prophets, I can own the triumph now. And here's a little story. I still remember when I first learned that the battle was not mine. At a very young age, I learned about the ABCs of prayer. I took them home with me, praying like a warrior. I believed I could conquer anything with just the right promise stuck in my promise machine. I would certainly conquer in this battle. Why, I had the promises. I did not know that surrender is the basis for prayer and promise and conquering. I did not know that I would need to continue the surrender. I did not know that giving up would continue all my life. Of course, my immature understanding of how to use the promises and prayer was no fault of the speaker who presented the ABCs of prayer. I was simply very young with a lot yet to learn. I thought that if I could pray hard enough right there by my bed, I would get good enough so that I could survive in the end. I would get good enough to win, to conquer. My aim was to pray a whole lot and be in the word to find the promises so I could get good enough 
to conquer. Now I know that conquering happens by surrender because the battle is not mine, but God's. Conquering happens by surrender, not only at the beginning of my walk, but all the way to the end. Surrender will go on and on and on. I'm never called to leave that first surrender to Christ. I never leave the cross, the giving up to him of everything. Now, my Bible study and prayer are deep and meaningful, putting me in touch with God. The 11th law of recovery says, though through daily Bible study and prayer and the increased awareness of God resulting from these disciplines, we nurture our love for God. As my awareness of him grows, so also does my awareness of my victory in him strange but perhaps you can now understand that for me surrender and success lie side by side like two tracks of the same railroad giving up and great expectations exist inside me as two parts of the same experience cross and resurrection both belong to the wonderful lion lamb with which i have to do it just gets better and better as I often say, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. He answers, the battle is not yours, Wilma. It's mine. So how can I own the triumph now? Surrender my own will, follow the slain lamb, and believe God's prophets. Next week, Revelation 12. No, Daniel 12 and Revelation 21 and 22. We will take two weeks, I think, to finish uh, that. But for now, let me read to you or present to you uh, another part of my work on beauty in the Bible. We're coming close to the end of that one, too. I'm watching a hummingbird at the feeder in the foothills of Colorado. His bill is like a small pipette, ready to disturb the blossoms, not at all while sucking up his nourishment. His wings in flight sound like a tiny helicopter, but here at the feeder, they're almost silent as they keep his body still, hanging in midair. What fascinates me right now is that he doesn't have to fly at the feeder each time to get his bill deep inside. His body remains in one place while his head bobs to get his bill in and out for sucking and then swallowing. Every structure of that bird is appropriate for his function. I'm watching a woodpecker on a telephone pole in Georgia. I banged my face against a tree. If I banged my face against a tree that hard and that long, I'd surely have a bad headache. Instead, this bird's bill is made to penetrate and his head is made to act like a hammerhead. His feet are certainly more powerfully tenacious than my feet or hands could ever be, since they and his tail are required to provide stability for the hammer action. Again, what fascinates me most is that his neck does all the action while the rest of his body remains tightly still. Every structure of this bird supports his function. Inspired by a note made, made by Leonardo da Vinci, his biographer Walter Isaacson researched and described the tongue of the woodpecker, which must reach through the long beak, far up and down inside the hole of the tree. Oh, that's this way. His tongue must reach inside the beak and down into the hole of the tree to find the insects and grubs. The tongue is so long that when not foraging, it retracts into the skull and its cartilage-like stru cartilage -like structure continues past the jaw to wrap around the bird's head and then curve down its nostril. <laughs> this arrangement cushions and shields the bird's brain 
from terrible shock during pecking. In this chapter, I will spend a few minutes in wonder over how the Bible's form and structure supports its function. I would like to study function on two levels, the human author's intended function to, in use of that form and God's intended function for his word. I have some problems with this stated goal. First, the human author is dead and I can't ask him about his intention. Second, I have no illusion that I as a human can interview God for the depths of God's intention. I am handicapped. Yet since the fit of form and function is another element of beauty, as I find it in the Bible, I am driven to comment here in meager patches of understanding of the beauty of form and function in the Bible. Actually, throughout this book, I've been showing you the marvelous effects of each form of my understanding through various instances and Bible references. Here then are some concluding observations regarding form and function in the Bible. My first aim has been to entice you to read the Bible more, willing to bathe in its beauty rather than insisting on bottling up some portion to prove or remember a point. I do believe the human authors could have understood the forms mentioned in this book and purposefully used them to illuminate the themes of their work. The forms we've been working with, like straight lines and curved lines and parallel lines. I do believe the authors could have used them on purpose. I also believe that much of the power of the various forms we studied can be passed to the reader without his or her conscious knowledge of the forms. The power of the form works whether or not it is recognized. I believe that God had a hand in the formation and preservation of the Bible and some choices were divine. An author could have chosen the form for writing as the authors of the four gospels each chose different artistic form. Or God could have chosen the form for the doing as parts of Genesis and Revelation claim to be the simple record of God's artistic form. As a painter intentionally structures his or her piece in order to direct the viewer's eyes on a path to the focal point, and that direction often happens subliminally. So I believe these forms direct the reader's mind toward what the author wanted humans to see. Of course, the stated themes of the author's work and of the Bible as a larger context will for me always inform the study of form and structure. If I let my mind connect in delight with the forms for a while, I believe the more overtly stated themes will seep into my identity, perhaps subliminally, while my conscious attention is averted to the beauty of the forms. Because I believe the stated themes of scripture are the goodness of God and the worthiness of Christ, any Bible form or structure that points to God and his Christ, attracting and holding my attention and homage would be worth my study and use. Finally, it seems to me that one of God's intentions was preservation and translation of the Bible over many years and into many languages. For that translation into many languages, the forms which we have addressed in this time together over the last several weeks are by far the best fit to bring into any language the beauty of the Bible. Therefore, I lift up this Bible. I hold it out to you. I invite you with joy into its pages, stories, and artistic forms. Will you try 
and let it thrill you as it does me. For the next two weeks, we will do a little bit of frequently asked questions about uh, artistic reading of the Bible. And uh, we, I think, will finish the Daniel and Revelation part, stories just about the same time we finish Beauty in the Bible. Before we go there, though, That'll be next week. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God in heaven. You have shown out again. I cannot help but be attracted to you for what you do for me and for what you have put in the Bible for many, many artistic eyes and ears to find. We love you. We are glad that you are the sovereign of this world. We are glad that you have preserved this much beauty to be all around us and draw our eyes to you. And yet so often, we let the troubles of this world, we let the goals, the greed of this world push you out of our lives. And I so ask that you will forgive me for this. And those of my friends who are watching and join my prayer, I ask for forgiveness for them too. For the times that we have put you on the back burner, for the times that we have searched in other places for our joys and successes, and for the times that we have hurt others in our vain search for joy on our own to win those battles that are not ours, but yours. So we ask your forgiveness in repentance for those we have hurt on our way. And freed at this point, we come to you with our requests. Some of my friends have their requests out on the table in front of them or in their hands on paper. Some of them have just their requests up there in the front of their mind ready for you to do something about. And some of us, Lord, we have requests that are so bur buried so deep that we can't even know them. I'm asking that you will hear our requests, whether it be for <clears throat> one of our friends or family who may be a far away or struggling with money or um, temptation or relationships or career. Lord, you, you can hear our needs, whether it be that we're, we're praying for our church or for our nation we do pray for our nation, Lord, especially right now. Or maybe we're praying for the world in all its troubles. Lord, you will hear us. We thank you that you are the strong one in our lives. We thank you that the battle is not ours, but yours. We thank you that you have promised to increase our belief. We thank you for your word. We've asked it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm Wilma Zollbach, and I'm with uh, Grace Chapel Fellowship. Grace Chapel Fellowship is a church to bless other churches where listening is our unity. And of course, I have about half dozen uh, specialties, themes that always pop up in my preaching. One of them is God is good. Mm -hmm, I believe that. The second one is that uh, humans have been taken away from good and God. The third one is that Jesus came to bring us back to good and to God. And then I have to say, God can. I can't. 
So I decide to let him. And then there are two more. One, the Bible is worth reading. And the second one, the Sabbath is a gift worth remembering. So I hope to see you next week. And uh, God bless you. In the meantime.